All right, guys, welcome back to the Everything Calls World podcast. Damian and Nick here. We're doing our 2022 preview and prediction for the Pittsburgh Panthers, the reigning ACC champions. Look at this coaching staff. Pat Narduzzi enters his eighth year, 53-37 and 37 record overall. Frank Signetti, he takes over from Mark Whipple. He departs for Nebraska. Signetti spent the past two years at Boston College. Tons of NFL experience. That's going to be a big year as Keaton Slovis transfers in from USC. Randy Bates will be the defensive play caller. He's been in the same role since 2018. And of course, the biggest headlines of this offseason, Jordan Addison, a late transfer to USC, uh, mainly probably because of the NLI, and then Kenny Pickett was a first-round selection. And this team returns 14 starters from, yes, what was the best team in the conference last season. Looking at this offense, as we just mentioned, Keaton Slovis, Nick, he's going to replace Kenny Pickett. Ideal replacement, in my eyes, as soon as he announced he was transferring, I knew he was going to go to Pitt that same day, well, as soon as Riley was hired, really. You know, his girlfriend goes to Pittsburgh, so that was obviously a big deciding factor as well, but I think Matching up with Pat Narduzzi and Frank Signetti, I think this is a great opportunity for Slovis to shine with Signetti, who's, of course, a longtime QB coach. He's shown great touch, nice accuracy and vision. Not always consistent in those categories, though. He doesn't have the strongest of arms either, but I think pairing him up with Signetti is going to do wonders for his draft stock. Slovis is a solid player. I like the move here coming to Pitt. You know, Pitt fans, some of them act like the sky was falling when they lost Addison and Pickett this offseason. But like you said, they returned 14 stars on both sides of the ball. So it's a really solid team on paper across the board. They bring in a guy like Slovis who has some decent experience in the Pac-12. Played all right at times for, for USC last year. I like the accuracy. I like the, ar- I like the arm. It's a little weak, but I, I think it's also some t- decent talent there. I worry about the turnovers a little bit. Eight interceptions last year. Leaves a little bit to be desired with the 11 touchdowns as well. But I think he's a solid quarterback here. I think they'll coach him up will fit well in the system. Yeah, you know, he never really developed under Graham Harrell. He's gone to West Virginia, and he'll actually play in week one. JT Daniel will be the starter for WVU, so some connections there. Look at the schedule a little later. Three running backs, though. That's 500-plus yards last year. Israel, plenty of ability and speed for being down 215-pounder. Also, a kick return touchdown on only seven attempts, so, you know, average about 30 yards per return. So they got him involved in a variety of different ways. Caught 24 balls, ran for 650 plus yards and seven scores. Seems like Vincent Davis has been around forever. Him and Rodney Hampton are both 170 pounds each. 150 yards per game last year, Nick's a pretty good mark considering how much they aired it out. How do you feel about this running game? I actually really like this running game. I think it's one of the better in the ACC. A bit of an underrated trio here with these three guys. I think Davis, I expect him to have a decent year this year. 4.2 yards per carry, four touchdowns for him last year. I look at Rodney Hammond Jr., you know, 505 yards on the ground, about five yards per carry and five touchdowns for him as well. They spread the wealth with these backs. Each of these guys have over 500 yards. And I think expect to see a similar thing this year. They'll be able to have a nice triple option here to kind of play what they want to do, use these guys in different regards. I love all three of them. I think they each have different sort of skill sets. And I also think that the special teams aspect from these guys is nice as well. Now the aforementioned Jordan Addison, he departs and, you know, bailed late. Tazir Mack is gone. Lucas Kroll graduates. This is a pretty depleted wide receiver group. I like Jared Wayne. No, he's been around a long time. 47 receptions, 658 yards, six scores last year, 6'3", 210. Should be in for a big-time season. They also added two transfers. Um, one of them comes from Akron and Mumfield. And then Bud Means, I believe he comes over from Tennessee. None of these guys really have experience, and they're going to be leaned on heavily this year. I think they're lucky to have a guy like Gavin Barthamel at tight end. He was a number two last year, and I thought he had pretty good production as a number two. 28 receptions for 326 yards and four touchdowns as a number two tight end. That's pretty impressive work, but for the most part, this is a pretty watered-down receiver group that I have big concerns about, Nick. Yeah, the depth chart is looking really weak for these guys. I don't see a whole lot of depth here. Only lists about six guys total for the wide receivers. I get a little concerned because a lot of these guys are inexperienced. They come in as transfers. I think another guy that's interesting to look at is Jalen Braden. Solid wide receiver. Didn't had limited experience last year. 129 yards and four, about 14 yards per catch. No touchdowns for him. I expect to see him step up a little bit. I think he fits fits well in that slot role. Solid wide receiver. Nice junior of experience. But in general, this is such a depleted wide receiving core, like we said. And you know they just lack the talent and depth. They I feel like if someone gets injured early on, they could find themselves in serious trouble. Marv Olamio and Jared Wayne, those are the only two guys I'm really eyeing after that. It's going to be a mixed rotation to see who can step up. I think they might figure it out. I'm not overly confident in it, but I haven't seen Slovis with Signetti. And this running game, I think it'll ease the pressure a bit. Uh, we'll see what happens, though. They get back all five starters on the offensive line. This unit wasn't particularly great last year. Pickett found himself on the run a lot, it seemed. Marcus Miner is a guy I'm looking at. 6'4", 325. They get everybody back, though, so you would imagine that progress is imminent. How do you feel about this offensive line group? I really like how this offensive line returns five starters. You know, it's important to return these guys. They have great continuity. I love when offensive line works to get well together and they have experience. All these guys are at least redshirt seniors or grad transfer. They've played plenty of football. 
They looked sloppy at times last year. That certainly is true. But I think that the more reps they get, the better they play together. I love the way this offensive line works together. I think they'll be strong this year. Now, the offense should fall off a good bit, but I'd say, you know, 35 points per game at least compared to 41 last year is a reasonable expectation. What do you think from a points per game standpoint to keep things simple? Yeah, 35 should be right around where this is. I love the running backs with this. I think they'll be relying on the running game a little bit more than they did last year. I expect them to be focusing on that. Maybe they don't air it out as much, but I think there's a lot of talent in the running back core, and some of these wide receivers step up. This offense could be solid in the ACC. Now, looking at the defense, they get another seven starters back, three guys. Had 10 plus tackles for loss last year. They're all back. You know, this pass rush might be the nation's deepest. You look at Baldonado, Alexandre, 41 tackles last year. Dayon Hayes, he had eight tackles for loss. John Morgan, 11 QB hurries, five and a half sacks. This is a very deep unit. You mixed that with Kalijah Canthy, one of the nation's top defensive tackles, a six foot 275. He had seven sacks and 13 tackles for loss last year. David Green, he's also going to be there, a veteran. He's a 290 pounder. They're not very tall or big on the interior D line. You know, the biggest guy in the two deep was 300 pounds, and the tallest was six foot two. So they don't have overwhelming size by any means, but they have contributors, they have experience. I absolutely love this, this defensive line. They were among the nation's best last year in getting in the backfield third with 113 tackles for loss. They were first in that category in 2020. I think they should once again be in the top five this fall. This is a great defensive line. I love Kansi, thir- like you said, 13 tackles for loss, seven sacks, plus a p- pass breakup and a forced fumble, 33 total, tax and to- total tackles in total for him. I love the talent top to bottom. I think these guys are solid. You know, They may not be the biggest in the world, but I love the way they get to the quarterback. They put the pressure on, on, the, on the offense. They constantly keep the pressure up. These guys work well together. They return a lot of starters. I think this will be one of the deepest defensive lines in the country. 54 sacks was also one of the nation's top marks, so they have a lot of that cooking for them. Sixth in FBS and run defense, I think they could certainly crack the top three, top three in that category. You look at linebacker, they lose three, you know, very experienced veterans from last year, but they do return Servasie Dennis. He broke out in 2020 with 14 and a half tackles for loss. He had another 10 this past season. Also had a team high 87 tackles. Great burst. He's quite explosive for being 230. Impressive flexibility from Dennis. Uh, you know, they added two transfers, Shane Simon from Notre Dame being one of them. But getting Dennis back in the middle of this defense is massive for them, and I think they have a great front seven overall. Dennis, all-around talented player, had an interception. They returned for a touchdown last year as well. Ten tackles for loss, four sacks, and a fumble recovery. I love what he can do. He can do it all. He's definitely a playmaker. He'll quarterback this defense. I love it a lot. I think Dennis is a solid player. Now, looking at the biggest concern of this defense is last year, they uncharacteristically had a bad secondary. You know, that's not something you see under Narduzzi. You, you noticed it in week two against Tennessee where guys were wide open in every play. Joe Milton, though, has no touch, or they would have been in trouble. You know, they did lose to Western Michigan's skilled passing attack the next week. And then Tyler Van Dyke and Peyton Thorne had field days as well. You know, two freshmen that tore them apart. So the secondary has a lot to improve on. The loss of DeMar Hamlin at Paris Ford the year prior really proved to be fatal for the back end of this defense. 114th against the pass. They did snag 16 interceptions, allowed 26 touchdowns. Playmaking is never lacking on this defense, it seems. Pat Narduzzi, year after year, has guys that can make plays. That was the story last year, too. Eric Hallett was really good. 72 tackles, 9 pass breakups, 3 picks. Brandon Hill also had 79 stops and 8 plays on the ball. A.J. Woods at corner was pretty solid with 7 pass breakups. Uh, Damari Mathis was the lone departure, and he got drafted. So, they have talent. They just need to be better. You know, No ads in the portal. Pat has a lot of faith in this group, it appears, and I do, too. They have playmaking abilities, rotating, communicating positioning is the overall focus and i think they're going to take some big leaps this season i like the talent here i think hill's a good player coming back two interceptions last year f- f- five pass breakups plus a f- force fumble and a fumble recovery solid player i think they bring back what they need to bring back i like Hollett as well i think he's a talented player 68 total tackles last year this is a solid secondary i think they're going to improve this year because at times last year they looked very poor but this year they're going to be more you know work together these guys part of the nice offseason together. I think they have some serious potential to work together and build up the secondary, and it's going to improve. I think this will be one of the nation's top 10 defenses. Love what they have on the defensive line. Linebacker, they have a playmaker. And the secondary, again, I think will make some big strides. So we'll see what happens on that front. Looking at the schedule preview and prediction, you know, this might shock some people. might be a little bold to pick Pitt to go 11-1. But looking at the schedule, they have a few tough games, but not ones I have them losing. I'm concerned with the wide receiver group, but I have faith in Slovis as he should develop really well under Signetti this year. Get back all the running backs. They have a nice tight end, all five guys on the offensive line, and I just raved about the defense. And, you know, I don't think Narduzzi's going to settle for this type of performance out of the secondary. I think the back end, along with the offensive line, are going to make some big strides this year. That's going to, you know, lead to wonders this fall. And I think they'll find themselves competing for the ACC crown yet again. You know, I couldn't pick them to go undefeated, though. I think UVA catches them off guard late in the year of a very talented offense. 
the Miami game could potentially decide the division. Miami's had their number as of late, four or five in a row, four in the Canes. I think they dropped one late there at the UVA. 11 and one is where I'm going with, you know, a potential win in the ACC title game. Could put them in the CFP. Obviously, the backyard brawls back September 1st against West Virginia on a Thursday night. That'll be tough. The next week, they got Tennessee. But if they can start 2-0, and I like them to continue to stay hot and win games, even though at Louisville and at UNC are two games they're circling. I really, yeah, I really like this pit team across the board, and the schedule's not too bad. But I look at that that stretch in October, October 29th, at Louisville, at UNC. Very tough matchups on the road, especially Louisville. I think a lot of people are not paying attention to Louisville this offseason. I think they have some serious potential to catch some teams off guard. And UNC is a very talented roster that's deep, and I think their defense will be incredible this year. So I just worry that Pitt's offense might not be able to get points against UNC. Tennessee also, a lot of people are high on Tennessee in the SEC East. A lot of fire coming out of uh, Rocky Top. People love this team this year. I feel like Tennessee will disappoint. I think Tennessee losing to Pitt makes a whole lot of sense to me. But I'm going to go currently right now. I think 10-2 and two is more realistic. I think they will lose to UNC on October 29th. But 10-2 and two for this Pitt team, considering what they lost on offense, is still a really impressive season, and fans got to be happy with that. Now, if the secondary regresses somehow and gets worse, then they'd probably be one of the nation's worst pass defenses, and they could definitely lose four or five games, like the Miami one, UNC, Tennessee. Those will be tough games if the secondary can't step it up. I don't expect that one bit. That's certainly a key to watch. This is going to be it for today's episode. Nick, as always, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.